Hello and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast, the show about noise by those who love it and those who make it. I'm Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is Sam Risser of Jute, a newer harsh noise project based out of Montreal, Canada. Head over to the Patreon afterwards and check out the extended segments of the interview and get an exclusive 10-minute Jute video EP. By becoming a Patreon supporter, not only do you get tons of bonus content and benefits, but you help this show exist into the future. I really can't do this without you, so if you appreciate what I do here, visit patreon.com slash white noise to support. Hey, Sam. Hi. Welcome to White Sammy Noise Podcast. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome to meet you. Um, and we're going to talk about your project, Jute. Yes. Um, it's, you're, you're from Canada. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like to slap anyone with uh, labels, but you're a relative newcomer to noise and harsh noise at least at least from my from what i'm aware from the project i mean i I think jude has been around since 2019 right uh i mean you'd be correct in your assessment like i would even i definitely view myself as a as a newcomer uh to this kind of stuff and yeah 20 2018 and yeah the first tape was out i think by 2019 yeah yeah. But at the same time, I don't. I I I only use that in term because I I've, I saw that somewhere recently. I think in the description of 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 the new forces tape, it said newcomer. But I I've, I've been I've been. A, I guess the past few years have been so dense with so much noise activity and so much going on that it seems like it seems like you've been around and I I've been aware of your stuff for for much longer. I guess, but it's like I guess that is only a few years. But I don't know. It's it's. I mean, it's possible. Like I. I don't find it easy to keep up with with the amount of stuff that that comes out and and uh, sort of like new names that that crop up or even you know there's even older stuff that I sort of am just getting around to to hearing and, and stuff like that. So yeah, um, but it's cool. I mean, you you you've made quite a I think imprint. And I mean, I, I was looking back at your discography and I was trying. I was I was you have many much fewer releases than I. In, had in my mind. I mean, you've. I think in a, in a in a handful of releases, you've made quite an imprint and quite a unique stamp on, you know, this small scene. I would say. So, um, what, what's what's Canadian harsh noise scene like right now? Because I mean, I I know of like the. I mean, I'm very familiar with like the iconic Vancouver scene that I was really active when I was sort of discovering noise in like the mid two thousands. Um, you know, of course the Rita taskmaster and Rasulka are kind of the big three that I think of there, there, there are a bunch more. Um, but you're from, well, I don't know if you're from Montreal, but you're living in Montreal, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's a whole different vibe. And it seems like there's a quite pretty active Canadian harsh noise scene kind of flourishing right now of, of newer artists. I think, I mean, so yeah, it's. It's interesting. Like I, so I'm, I'm from Alberta originally, which is on the prairies sort of Mm -hmm. above Montana. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I finished high school, uh, I moved to Vancouver for a number of years Mm -hmm. and I worked, lived and worked there and was mostly involved in like punk and hardcore and stuff like that. Um, but around the time I was, yeah, 19 or 20 and starting to hear like, uh, 
like uh, Throbbing Gristle for the first time and uh, sort of just, yeah, like classic industrial stuff. Uh, I was really captivated with it and sort of immediately wanted to start buying like, uh, like I bought like a micro Korg synthesizer mm -hmm. and, and became inter like really interested in this sort of like underground electronic music, but noise proper for me like i definitely was like exposed to stuff like uh the rita and like taskmaster and stuff like that when i lived mm -hmm. there and it was kind of uh not that i i couldn't even say i wasn't into it but it kind of just like passed me by in a certain sure. way and it, it didn't really grab me much at that point and so but towards towards the end of my 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 time living there before i moved here uh I did through through people like uh, like like Sam and Mel Paget and mm -hmm. um, and Nick Wainwright and stuff and uh, Blair who did the project uh, Moisture Discipline uh, yeah. sort of started to get turned on to stuff like Macronympha. I think that was the big thing where I sort of got interested in in noise. Uh, proper and harsh noise and so I moved here shortly after and there's definitely in Montreal uh, a very strong experimental music scene uh, electronics and and like free jazz and, and stuff like that now available at Oxen Records Incapacitance Oxen Man's Uneasiness CD Nobody Woods and Wires CD title still available Dressing From the Body to the Door CD Purgist Heart Sink CD, Scum and Unsustainable Social Condition, Necessary Downfall CD, Leah P, Surviving the Familiar CD, available at oxenrecords.bigcartel.com. Yeah, but like, what about the, the network of like, I don't know if it's a network, but I mean, I kind of see a, like a loose association of, of you know, like there's you, there's Mott, right? Mott, Mott's Canadian? I believe so, yes. There's uh, um, Toanch, or Toanch Dwelling. Yes, uh, cool Barrett. project. Yeah, yeah. Vastfield um, Magnetism, uh, his label. They're doing really, really great stuff right now. Yeah. Um, so, Murmur, right? Murmur also, Canadian. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, yeah. See, I'm also like, I'm even still a little bit like, uh, uh, maybe unaware or, or, or unsure about some sure. stuff. But, uh, yeah, I I would agree. No, I think there is. Well, yeah, I think there is just sort of like a new generation of people who are sort of like discovering what noise like is or can be yeah. for them you know like that's that's kind of how i look at it like it's sort of all of a sudden i just sort of saw all these things that it could be in relation to my own interests and and obsessions and and, and stuff like that yes yeah. and I, yeah. I think and you know so i think yeah a lot of people are sort of maybe getting to that place as well it feels like that it feels like it feels like that handful of artists i mean like i said maybe not in a loose association i mean maybe everyone's kind of doing their own thing and canada's huge i i always you know kind of just assume oh canada like everyone's hanging out together but it's, it's so it is. it's so wide i mean people are so, so far apart so i mean but 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 those handful of artists that i kind of come to mind are really you include our doing things that are quite unique. I feel like it's like a very, yeah. Like finding, finding their own meaning to noise, but it's, 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 it's original. It's still part of the, it feels like it's part of the noise, harsh noise tradition, everything like that, but not, and also not like aping the, the Vancouver sound thing or like, you know, like I feel like people around the world are aping the Fa Vancouver sound or were, or have been maybe not anymore as much, but I mean like the read, I think is the most bit off of artist, ever in harsh noise at this point and sure, all that uh, very, you know like the even the, the the visual aesthetic i mean sometimes i, I see s s new stuff coming out that just looks exactly like his stuff and etc cetera, etc cetera. but 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 a lot of those yeah like you and a lot of those other guys all are doing very different things each one and it's not it's not part of that so i don't know yeah i, I think it's cool i mean i'm just curious if curious what's going on there i haven't been i mean i'm, I'm kind of like a little bit late to it a little kind of catching up like oh shit there's a lot of cool well, noise going on in canada like 
Yeah, I mean, it's I, like I same for me, even you know, like. Uh, but it, I, you're you're right in saying like the the geographical reality of of living in Canada definitely like uh, lends itself to people. Like, of course, I mean everyone is kind of aware, I feel like, like everyone you, you, you mention and, and stuff, like everyone's kind of aware of each other's work, I feel like, and, mm -hmm. but maybe not like explicitly in contact with, with okay. one another or sure. only to, to varying degrees or, you know, whether it's just, uh, picking up a tape or like a comment on the, you know, new tape out, like awesome. Sounds great. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think it also does, I don't know, like, uh, it does also like kind of lend to the situation of people y y winding up doing something that is maybe a little more unique. Like it's, it's not as easy to in Canada to be like ordering tons of new music from outside of the country because yeah. just uh, the current, especially from America right now, like the currency exchanges yeah. is insane. Um, and, and, or even just, you know, like sending packages domestically can even be pretty expensive depending on how far it has to go. So, yeah, uh, there's like definitely isolation that cuts like in a good way and in a bad way as, as well. I, yeah, I, I, I do think isolation in some ways is a good thing as long as people are active, but I think people kind of staying away from each other and not being too influenced from each other is often a good thing. I mean the, the 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 social element and the the encouragement is very cool, but it's nice it's nice to see sounds that and approaches and aesthetics and ideas that kind of just develop independently. For sure, I mean, know, like from, I, from within or from from or from real, you know, I don't want to say from real life, but from other things than noise influenced by noise, you know. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. There need, maybe there needs to be a new um, underground Canada compilation. Like the Mother Savage, you know, like did back in the day, and that's like a a lot of those artists on there. You don't even really think of them being from Canada. I mean, you do, but I mean, like they're very, they're I think, all just. Uh, I think something like that might be in the works. Actually, are you speaking uh, with with insider knowledge? I'm speaking with slight insider knowledge. That's uh, I don't know how much I should. You know, I don't want to blow someone's spot up. Before, you know, I'm not trying to tell tales out, out of school, uh, but <laughs> I did speak to someone recently and was approached to contribute material to a Canadian compilation of underground noise and electronic music. So okay. uh, you can maybe expect that on, well, I won't say too much more, <laughs> just in case, you know, I don't know, like, yeah. Is it bad to, to not to not give the props now or to and to have it you know what if what if something goes wrong huh? tell us tell us tell us who cares i mean i don't know uh, so i i disaster sources who recently did the uh four oh. closed walls and yes. uh uh catholic stare uh exactly, cassettes. Um, exactly. So think... no, another good canadian project that's 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 fresh and you know seemingly very fresh and very new and that's that's, that's awesome okay that's great that's good so I think there might be, yeah, I think there is something like that in the works, which will be really great because I, I agree that there's, there's a critical mass going on of material for sure, or potential. Yeah. To be. Nice. Yeah. I just, um, also interviewed, uh, Jason Kushner, AKA Saudi of two assistant deputy ministers who's, you know, also, you know, living in Jap lived in Japan for the past 25 more years, but also Canadian. I didn't know. I didn't know that actually. Do you know that guy? You're familiar with his stuff or his work or his? Okay, I'm familiar with him. Yeah, but uh, yeah. not uh, personally at all or yeah, anything like that. No. Oh, amazing. No, he's full on. Yeah, he's full on Canadian, and uh, he has a track on that original Underground Canada um, compilation uh, that Mother Savage did back in whenever the '90s. Um, but yeah, I, in the interview, he had, he told a really interesting story, a really funny story about it. So uh, I won't give it up now but it's it's yeah, I'll look forward it's, to it's that. funny it's definitely interesting um awesome. um what, what does the name jute mean by the way 
So jute is like just uh, it's a uh, like it's uh, fibers from a certain kind of plant, like a jute plant. Okay. Uh, it's, I feel bad that I don't you know know the name of the scientific name or something off the top of my head, but it's like uh, you know like a, what a, a sack of coffee beans might be made out of that sort of brown burlap rough, kind of. Kind of like burlap, yeah, like a rough hewn brown fiber made from uh yeah plant fibers uh woven into sort of rope or string or whatever okay. and it's just something that I, I like this cla I find it's maybe kind of a classic thing with noise projects, like a word that's just kind of looks good and is a little bit mysterious in a way, but it you know looking into it it's it's pretty mundane actually but um it, it also has an, a textural association i mean there i think uh, if, like to go i guess deeper what i like about it is the it's sort of like a very yeah simple thing that like comes from the earth and is simple to manufacture and sort of to contrast with the sort of like highly technologized yeah world that we live in that's sort of like one of the main preoccupations of of the project is, yeah. is technology and and stuff like that so yeah that's sort of where that comes from but more than anything i kind of just i saw it in a book or so i just thought that's yeah that's good i Short, did, now i know that, yeah now now i know I, I know i've heard of a jute sack before or jute but yeah. i didn't i didn't yeah. i thought it was maybe ute or something like that yeah um, so, so you kind of just hinted at it, but that's something I've definitely picked up on the project, um, and the sounds and the aesthetics and the little bits and pieces of, you know, kind of text or yeah, just imagery that I've seen associated with it is, uh, this, yeah, this, this technological element of it, like industrial technological kind of theme that runs through it. What, what, what can you tell me about that? Uh, yeah. Um, it's like, I guess coming from a background in like punk and, and hardcore and stuff, uh, there's sort of the seeds of, uh, you know, being distrustful of, authority and, and power mm -hmm. structures and things like that. But in my teenage years, like I was pretty lucky. I mean, first of all, we just kind of like, we live in a really insanely technologically mediated world now. And, you know, I'm in my early thirties. Uh, it's, it's wilder than I would have even thought, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but, when I was a bit, I was lucky to sort of get introduced to like cra like crass mm -hmm. uh, and crass, like really early on. And, um, one of my friends passed along this book to me when I was 16 or 17 years old, um, that sort of dealt pretty extensively with like the emergence of the modern like surveillance state and the ways that, uh, technologically that that was, you know, purportedly going to unfurl. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as I got into my later twenties and stuff, like I just, it was like, holy fuck. Like, I'm not going to credit the book because I don't really believe the author is uh, anyways, it's not really important, but mm -hmm. it was just kind of this, th this scary experience of like, you know, this like specter from a book from my, from my youth that made things sound really scary. And then things kind of started to happen. Like it, it yeah. said, you know, and, yeah. uh, so it's always just kind of been, I don't know. It's just always kind of been a weird uh, obsession of mine. You know, one of my favorite books is, is 1984. And, uh, yeah, the, the idea of this sort of like panoptic surveillance state that exists, but you know, it exists because like we all need to have a phone, 
you know, for right. our jobs or, or whatever, you know, there's just these crafty ways that yeah. uh, things go down and it's very, well, yeah, it just like, it, it, it troubles me in a lot of ways. And, and when I was first, so when I was first getting into like harsh noise proper and like moving away from maybe just more like conventional, like industrial music mm -hmm. or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I, I just had this thought one day, like I've always been, I've always been into, and I, I've always been into like sci-fi more broadly, um, for similar reasons that, you know, like it, it, it says a lot about our, our society. And, yeah. um, I just kind of had this thought about like the term cyberpunk mm -hmm. one day, um, and how it's, you know, it's, it's mostly just kind of like a marketing word for certain kinds of like literature or media or whatever. But I just, I thought like, fuck, like harsh noise and like noise music is kind of like real life, like cyberpunk mm -hmm. music because it's so caught up in using communications technology. Like, yes, some of the technology is, is musical in its conception and stuff, but also like, you know, tape recorders and stuff, that's, that's communications technology. And, and the sort of, you know, I was watching the uh, Stuart Skinner interview again the other day, and he was talking about, you know, sort of like the inherent di interdisciplinarity that comes with starting a noise project. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, you got to get some images. You got to have, it's, yeah it's just this, in it's this interesting thing, you know, of like, it's like, a. it's, it lives in that world of, of that technology and, and even the idea of noise itself as sort of like pure information, like mm -hmm. an overload of information, like too much information to process equals noise. So I just making all these connections, I just sort of, it really, captivated me to try and like work in that direction and make something that maybe gets some of that across, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, do, do you think of your project as a cyberpunk project? That is, kind of, yeah. Like that is kind of how I think about it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, and you go back, you know, and you watch like old sci-fi movies from the eighties and it's said in, you know, I think Blade Runner is what's said in 2019. Yeah. And then you think, you think like, oh fuck, like, yeah, like I live, I live in this like weird future in a, in a lot of ways. It's, it's the thing of being like the fish in the water, right? Like you don't really realize maybe how right. radically things are changing because you just live your life. Right. But yeah, I kind of want to like remind ah, not remind people because people don't have to buy into what i think about this stuff but you know i want to i want to poke that you know i want to yeah. get that across a little bit maybe what do you like in your personal life in your daily life how do you deal with that topic i mean outside of making art about it or being interested in it like how do you go about dealing with that, you know, imposing, impending, you know, surveillance overlord, essentially. I mean, I assume you're not just like, oh, this is crazy and bad, but I'm just. Sure. I mean, I can't say, I'm not going to say that I'm a super politically active person. Um, you know, I'm not like actively writing petitions to roll back security measures or whatever, but I would gladly, you know, maybe sign on with someone who was doing something like that. But ah, I just kind of try to not, I think one of the main things for me, and this will come back maybe a little bit to doing noise and doing art and stuff, but I just try not to valorize the technology and technology in general. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't think there's any good reason that every year, every synthesizer company in the world, like releases like a number of new synthesizers when like nothing new is really 
becoming of it, right? Um, um, I, I just want to be, I just try to be critical. I try to, you know, I don't like watch TV mm-hmm. very much. <laughs> just simple shit like that. I mean, yeah. I, uh, there was a great uh, CD of Josh Peterson's spoken word and like mm-hmm. tape collage that came out mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a couple of years ago. Yep. And there's a piece on it. I can't remember the name. But it's it's a really great like uh, you know uh, he's, he's voice saying like you know take note of like where the cameras are in your neighborhood and like don't mm-hmm. wear extravagant flashy outfits that you know that's right right I mean in my mind of minds I'm like oh yeah that's like that's fucking good advice but yeah. like I mean for the most part I just kind of try to keep my nose down my head down and 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 live my life and i just but i i if anything i i just push myself and others maybe to try and be critical of the dark side of the conveniences that are offered to us by things like smartphones and things like i i don't always take my smartphone out with me when i like go shopping or whatever you know like right i don't want to sound like i'm a total tinfoil hat but it's just it's a fact that like data flows out of that and it gets used for stuff that I don't really, you know, I don't know much about. So if I leave it at home, I don't have to worry about it, I guess. But for the most part, I just kind of, I'm just a work a day guy, you know? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) What, what, What do you think is, what do you think are some of the most potentially dangerous things that come of that? Well, it's I, mean, just I, I know, like, I know, I know. Theoretically, we say, we say, like, okay, you know, just, just, you don't want to, you don't want to give up that, right? But what, what are some, what are some things that you like could be concretely worried about? Or, or well, I think things? definitely one thing is sort of like the the economy that's built on the back of this data that's collected. You know, there's there's sort of like when we use these devices or like social media platforms, the the implicit trade off by agreeing to the TOC or whatever, uh, TOA, whatever the fuck it's called Mm -hmm. is like, you use our platform and like, we use your data in like X, Y, Z ways. And, you know, for the most part, that's just marketing and, and things like that, but, uh, it can easily become something else. Right. Right. Um, so there's that, Um, and there is, you know, sort of a movement of, of people who like want to push for more equity in that sort of like economic equation, like, uh, either compensate people more completely in a material way that actually helps them. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, like maybe people are getting a check or something. If you're someone whose data is like mined constantly, I, I mean, I'm Mm kind of talking out of my ass here a little bit, but. Um, and then just other stuff of, you know, like, uh, having, you know, just interests and opinions and things out there publicly that like maybe down the line are used, you know, maybe they're not okay anymore or whatever, you know, like it might be used against you in some way. I don't know Mm -hmm. how crazy all of this makes me sound, but, um, I just think there's a, I mean, no, I mean, I, 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 I totally, I mean. I'm not super um, diligent about this kind of stuff, but you're absolutely right. Like, I just think basically at, at, at the core of it, like, I just think things move so fast now that we don't actually keep up with them very well. And, and we haven't adjusted to like start doing that and like looking at things a little more deeply and not just saying like, well, let the companies decide, you know, So, yeah, this is, I mean, this is kind of a cliche topic or, or thing to complain about or, or, or analyze or critique, but what do you think about the noise scene? And I assume, I mean, I assume these days also the punk scene and all other underground scenes, I would imagine existing largely on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, it's. 
it's another thing. Like, it's totally, it's just double-edged. Like, it's so, it facilitates so much, you know, so much uh, in terms of, like, tour. I mean, touring's in a weird place now since COVID and stuff, but um, being able to, like, plan a tour or a show or promote those things or to showcase your work uh, or to just even meet like like-minded people you mm -hmm. know it's like it's so good for all that stuff and like mm -hmm. i'm someone who has basically grown up like alongside you know i've kind of been through like every iteration of these social media things like myspace mm -hmm. like whatever just message boards before that um but i think yeah, what people should maybe think a little bit more about. And it's like, maybe, you know, you would see it more in the nineties when like the internet was maybe a little more fresh and people like interested and involved in programming and yeah. making web pages and running servers and stuff. Like, um, I don't know shit about any of that stuff. So, uh, but like, um, this, this stuff all flows through just a small number of like of outlets and platforms. And if they decide they don't want to give it up for free anymore, or they don't want to let you do this or that, then you're fucked. What are you going to do? They don't, you're going to petition them to allow you to put your harsh noise titty collages back up on Instagram. Yeah. Like, no, yeah, they don't care. You know, like, uh, yeah. Uh, in, so there's just, uh, it funnels things, right? And if that, and if a spout on one of those funnels gets shut off, it's like there's going to be a lot of people. Like if Instagram was like, "Oh, we're going to charge you a hundred dollars a year to sign up," like how many people are going to do that? I don't think that'll ever happen. But right. uh, there could be other things, you know, that lead people to like maybe not want to use it and then be stuck. Like, yeah. You I almost think... can't go back to the old ways because it's so expensive even to just be sending mail and stuff around, like right. getting a release together. Like I just send you the files and you get them and it doesn't cost us anything, you know, except for our bill at the end of the month for the internet. Right. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I also wonder about the, the, the censorship issue too. I mean, I am I'm one who will self-censor myself anyway, for a number of reasons, but at the same time, it is weird that, you know, you'll find, you know, if you're making a post on Instagram or something like that, or I don't know if, what the status of Twitter is, but I don't, whatever, but you know, you, certain words get, tr certain words trigger, um, yeah. either being, you know, banned or blocked or, or shadow banned or, you know, a number of things, but like certain, you know, you see even like mainstream things, you know, they'll like some rap, blog or rap music will be like so and so shot so and so, but it'll like put a little like symbol over the word shot or you know, like yeah. it'll. It, it, there's all this it's kind of like self sense. You know, like have you have you uh, fact checkers said this was la la la? Like yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe, that's just as dubious as anything else. Like yeah, I find exactly. it funny. You know, people now are like, oh, what's so great about the internet is, you know, when I used to read a book, you just take what the book says and you're on your own, but now you can fact check. And it's like, well, the, the people who are, it's just as fallible that the people who are running the site you're fact checking on it could, could be wrong. Like, yeah. you know, like, well, and that's, that's one thing that I've realized in the past few years that I'm like totally out of the loop on seemingly because I, I feel like when I, was younger and when Google was still sort of, I remember, I remember my, in middle school, my teacher kind of like one of the more radical, crazy teachers was like, use Google kids. It's like, you know, like that was before we knew what Google was. And it was kind of like still new use Google. It's like, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. You, have the, you have the fucking world at your fingertips and it's, it's all there. And so I kind of always had this kind of thing in my mind. Like Google is like the best source for it. I feel like in the past few years, five years or something like that, every time I Google something, I'm like, first page is full of like the same, yeah. you know, like sponsored kind of result. And then I'm like, can't really be fucked to go to the second page, let alone the third or fourth page. Sure. Yeah. No, especially, totally. especially in Europe, there's, there's like some, I don't know if it's data protection or something, but they, there's weird, you know, in Europe, when you Google search something at the bottom of the page, they'll 
sometimes be like very few results. And it's like due to this law, we have like filtered out a lot of. Oh, whoa! I think it's it seems to be more like if you Google someone's name, if something it, Google someone's name or something like that, or something to do with okay. a person. I don't know what it is, but it just, it, for, for me, it just seems like Google and the internet in general has become so – like I feel like I'm at a shopping mall or something like that. Well, it's just – it's – yeah. I mean like – With like the same event, like 50 and, like chain shops, you know, like Foot Locker yeah. and whatever. Like I'm like – I would say that's like basically exactly like what's gone on. It's like who who has the most money and who can – support the most like infrastructure to run the internet and it's like like i read i don't know what the stat is but i did read a stat at one point that said like you know like most of the internet at this point like traffic wise passes through amazon servers so it's like people who want to like not support amazon like in a lot of ways they're just like if you're on the internet, you're, you're probably, you know, it's probably going through an Amazon server if you're in North America or Europe or, or whatever. And it's, yeah, I don't know. It, it, I feel like at the end of the 80s and the early 90s and stuff, when it was new technology, the talk was all like, whoa, the internet is like, it's going to decentralize everything. It's like the ultimate democratic thing. And we've just seen like the total opposite yeah. happen. And I'm not even like... I don't want people to think like I know anything about like deep, like computer hacker shit or anything like that. But it's just, you know, for me, I can just kind of see the writing on the wall. Like it's, it's the opposite of what all those people said it would be. It's. It yeah, is. It's exactly. Like, I'm, I'm the exact same way. I know nothing about that. I've never learned that or followed that or like thought I needed that. But all, all of a sudden I kind of feel like I'm like, a f- I'm like a fish in a barrel at this point. Like I'm like someone who knows very little about the what's going on under the hood of computers okay. or the internet. And like, I'm just going to like, okay, I need to find something. I need to buy something. I'm just going to like pull out my phone and like sure Google and like yeah. probably find something on the first page and be like, this is probably right. I guess. I don't know. It's like, and I feel so like I guess know, that's, that's like, maybe that's like part of the jute angle is like, we need to start, maybe we do need to start like thinking about like what's under the hood and like, maybe you do need to like start engaging with like hacker culture or something, you know, like from, from the past and like learn a little bit about how shit works. I don't know. Just as like a a matter of like practical survivability or like just consumer awareness, whatever you want to like, however you want to frame it, just like looking after yourself. Like we live on the fucking internet, you know, like we do. You know, exactly. A lot of people do. A lot of the world does. So, like, let's have a little, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just taking responsibility, I, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's yeah. it, 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 and it's scary that we don't. I mean, it is it is scary. It's very it's very weird because we're yeah exactly we we do we're we're simultaneously hooked into it and more and more totally ignorant of it. I have the feeling. Yeah. With jute, um, your sound is very, it is very classic, but it also has some sort of elements that I feel like are in, 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 in employing like other sort of technological processes or, or, or tools or machinery. Is that, is that true? Or I, 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 I feel funny. I think I saw like on Instagram or something that you posted like a little screenshot or a little something of what looked like, uh, like a max patch or a pure data patch. Okay. Like are, you so using, are, you, are you using stuff like that in your work? In it's funny for most of the, for the stuff that's out there right now that I've done, it's all very classically it's pedals. It's recording noise and then processing noise for track. Like most of my stuff, I operate like doing a dub basically where mm-hmm. like I do, I can even maybe, Okay. I have a quarter. I have a quarter inch tape machine, and that's what I sort of like do my master bounces out to. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of what I use to generate source sounds and stuff, it's like contact mic, my, my body mm-hmm. object, and I do have a very small modular uh, box mm-hmm. that uses uh, some stuff. And maybe I'll keep some of my secrets, but, uh, and, and then, and also like clap, like 
uh, feedback loops, you know, on yeah. a mixer. Yeah. Um, but it's more about getting all that stuff and then like a process of editing and, and dubbing it down to, to tape. But, uh, I do also have a, I have a bachelor's degree in electroacoustic mm -hmm. studies. They call it at mm -hmm. the university I attended and Um, that's also like part of, I think it's sort of like deepened. I started jute basically when I started my degree mm -hmm. and at a certain point, when you're learning about stuff like early electronic music and John Cage and Fluxus and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're in a university program that's still like in the music department. Um, you, for me, there was a big part of me that wanted to like call my teachers bluff in a mm -hmm. certain way. My professor's bluff and, and do and give them noise and stuff, you know, and say like, Oh, everything is music. Okay. Like, let's go yeah. like, let's get into it. And in a way that's because the other thing in school, this comes back to like the technology thing is if you're not heavy into a composition background, then you're probably heavy into a recording track. You want to be a recording engineer or you want to do uh, like multi-channel sound art compositions that relies on pretty like intense uh, high end systems and treated rooms and stuff like that. Um, and I just kind of being in that sound art academic world where at the same time, you know, uh, the big current now is like, let's horizontalize, like let's get people included. Um, like let's hear different voices, but uh, it all has to go through state of the art, top of the line equipment that mm -hmm. only the, only the university is going to have or only a gallery is going to be able to front you the money for. So yeah. it's the same thing. Like we were talking about with the, the websites and, and stuff like that. Like there's still this mechanism of like, Oh yeah, do whatever you want, but it has to pass through these like very few institutionalized sort mm -hmm. of like channels. And I just thought like, no, like let's look into not doing that and using I tried to use stuff that I find on the curbs and stuff here in Montreal, old stereo receivers mm -hmm. and uh, car speakers and stuff like that. And so when I, when I get a bunch of objects like that together, it's about like building feedback circuits out of them mm -hmm. and recording like the sounds that come out of, of that and using that as raw material. Um, because, Otherwise, you're just stuck in this world of, of of valorizing technology that, yeah, like I said, like can have a really dark, dark side to it. So, um, but coming back to like Max, I've not used any Max on like proper jute recordings, but I have done Max programming for school and performed. Mm -hmm. I did a performance in Nova Scotia uh, this past summer that was using. Uh, a max patch that was sort of built to emulate like a, if you were using a four tracker to play mm -hmm. noise or loops or whatever, but certain parts of it were automated to sort of like cut it up randomly for mm -hmm. you. So I'm not averse to using stuff like that. Um, but my engagement with like the old ways or whatever, using analog equipment is not, I do love the way it sounds. But I think being in school, I was forced to like rationalize that and like find other reasons why it was appealing or necessary for me to like try and use tape and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, if it wasn't more readily available to me, I would seek it out, but it is, I could get this stuff cheaply. Like I'm not into spending, you know, I'll spend what I have to, but I'm not looking to spend a lot. I don't know. If I'm getting yeah. off the track a little bit. Here. No, no, no. I, 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 that's interesting. Um, but that's also interesting that you, you know, you, yeah, you know, Max, I mean, that, that, that comes kind of back down to the genre preferences, I, or at least I, I see them visible because you know, Max and you've done Max programming and just apparently something that was quite similar to a noise 
performance and a noise patch and, and stuff, stuff that, but you did that for your university. So you did that for the institution and then for your own kind of like personal independent work, you don't use that kind of technology. I've and done that's, a that's, little that, that, that seems to be the, 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 a very common uh, separation. It's the, uh, well, no, it's the other way, actually. I, I did a performance just uh, through like uh, Chris from Buried in Slag and Debris. He, mm -hmm. he was able to get me on a show. I have family in Nova Scotia that I was visiting and I thought oh. like, oh, if I had my laptop with me, I was work. What it was is I was working on the patch for school, uh -huh. but wanted to try it out. So I see. And I, the, I mean, so it was but, a jute. It was a jute performance that you did with Max. Yes. Okay, I understand. Sorry, okay, that's what I'm trying. That would have been the easy way to say it. No, no, no. I, I, I understand. I, I misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, and in and at school, like I frequently gave them stuff that I was working on that was intended to be for jute. Like yeah, uh, yeah. I tried not to s uh, switch it up as yeah. it were. A lot of people in the program are musicians like accomplished brilliant musicians and also like brilliant with a computer and they they do brilliant stuff but like i'm uh, not that kind of musician you know yeah <laughs> why do you think though that there is that kind of aversion to that kind of technology in in noise in the noise scene as we know it i mean there's there's different subsections of the noise scene that maybe don't have much to do with each other. You know, there's probably, there's a whole kind of like world, I think of people who are very open to using that kind of stuff, but there's not a lot of crossover and there's kind of like a lot of. Totally. Especially in like harsh noise, right? Yeah, like yeah, all... exactly. Exactly. Is it just an, is it just, a, is it just a sound aesthetic thing? I mean, I've heard, I know people say, oh yeah, I don't like the sound of, of that stuff, but I mean, is it just that or is that, or is there more to it? I think definitely part of it is like just the sound. There's going to be a different sound there if, well, it, it just depends on what people do with it, right? Like you can make digital recordings that totally sound mother savage, crunchy, fucking yeah. It sounds analog, you know, yeah. like totally possible. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, there's jute recordings that are before I had the tape machine, like they're not mastered to tape, but like fuck, I tried to get it, yeah, sounding good, you know, at least yeah. when it went down on the tape that was being used for the master, like on a cassette or whatever. Yeah. Like, that also just comes from like being in school though, and having a little bit of knowledge about like what's going on and what, yeah, what you can actually accomplish, you know, what, what you stand to gain by using actual tape. Like it is, you do, you stand to gain good things, I would say, yeah. but it's like for people who think that you have to have this and that you don't, you don't ha have to have this or that anything you know but i think i think part of it is like not hearing stuff made with a computer that sounds otherwise if mm -hmm. that makes sense you know mm -hmm. like a lot of the time people who make stuff with the computer they don't have a problem with it so like they're not trying to make it sound less you know they're not trying to get away from that certain level of fidelity but right um a lot of people who are interested in this kind of music, like they want to hear something a little different with a little bit of a noise floor. And yeah. to me, to me, tape and stuff is like, it's like a, uh, it's like clay and you're yeah. like pressing your sounds down into the clay. And the clay is also something that like holds and binds and glues and, and is a thing in itself. Um, Absolutely. I mean, of uh, course, that is a huge and tape is a very remarkable and special thing that does ma that does magic to sounds and different kinds of magic. But you can also you can also rely on it too. I mean, you can also I mean, it is the easiest way to master your stuff. I mean, when I like when I do when I dub tapes, for example, like for my label, I've never had anyone master. Like I'll have stuff mastered for. CD or vinyl because it has, yeah. you know, different th formats that need that need that. But usually, if it's a t if it's someone sends me a tape master, even if I hear some kind of wild fluctuations and dynamics or something like that, where I would think mm, it's a little off, or, or you know, I always know that if I hit the tape hot, 
and record it, it's going to do that perfect, quick and dirty mastering job that's going to make it, I mean, it's going to change the way it sounds a bit, of course. I mean, I hope they're okay with that. But I mean, it's like, yeah. I know I know it's going to give it that certain but It's going to change it in a way. The best, the way I always explain it, and the way they kind of explain it at school or whatever, so we'll, we'll drop some science yeah. here, I guess. Like, when you when you hit the tape hard and overdrive it, your sound waves are folding back in on themselves and the yeah. waveform is becoming more and more complex yeah. and your brain loves that yeah. fucking distort. That's what distortion is. And it yeah. just loves it. So it's yeah. like, that's a real thing. And when you, when you clip something digitally, it just truncates the waveform and it sounds like yeah. shit. I mean, it sounds like one thing. There's context that that might be appealing, but it's yeah, like, but it's but it, oh, but it's pretty you, definite what it's going to sound like. There's not there's not a, there's not all that you know color and different differentiation in there. It's like once you hit that point, it's going to be the same. It's going to be that that sound. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So it's yeah. like um, I think a, there's a brilliant paper I I read uh, at school. And now I can't I can't think of who wrote it. So. Forgive me if they ever see this, but they, they said something interesting. It was about noise music specifically, and it's like engagement with tape and, and analog circuitry and technology and and sort of a, a more general, maybe aesthetic sort of observation. But the fact that noise music is sort of associated with excess and like transgression of like limits in like whatever a number of areas mm -hmm. um the sound of noise on a hot overdriven tape is actually the sound like distortion itself is the sound of the limitations of the system that is mediating the sound so yeah. what you don't you kind of don't hear freedom like you know you're like oh noise is it's like you're actually hearing like constraints of a technological yeah. system. You're not hearing, and you're and you're fucking loving it, like yeah. uh, rather than hearing like some kind of like tr transcendence of that. Uh, that's interesting. I, that, that's captivating to me. That's very it's, interesting because uh, that might be the one of the differences between harsh noise and a, a more general description of noise as an experimental type of music where harsh noise is really a very specific sound and thing and phenomenon that happens in your brain. And maybe it is similar to, it is not sound of freedom. It's maybe, the, it's maybe closer to who knows sound, uh, you know, what you, t what you said about the, the, the fact that analog distortion has in the brain, m maybe it is more similar to what we experience in our brains in moments of, shall we, shall we say transgression or, or... Sure, because I mean, you could even say like when you come up on a limit in whatever context, that's a complex system or situation to to navigate, right? And I guess that's maybe something similar is going on with the sound there too. It's I feel like that's if I were to try to describe what that what why harsh noise is like so appealing or what it is, it is that feeling. It is that that feeling in the brain. That, yeah, like the, the sound uh, triggering that that sensation, and like you had Stefan uh, on last week or the week before, sorry, uh, and yeah. he was saying you know like something about it just feels yeah. so good when I listen to it, and it's like it's the same for me. Like when I just when I started to hear like macro, like I used to play shows like doing in, like industrial stuff, and yeah. my punk friends being like, "Oh, Sam, he's doing noise music," and I would be like, "It's not noise." Like I'd get yeah. offended, you know. Yeah. But now, like, when I just, you know, when I heard, like, fucking Pittsburgh or whatever, like, yeah. just that wild, like, yeah, ah, it's so, like, you're just, if it's good, like, you're just almost transported to, yeah. like, a different place and, like, you're riding a fucking horse or something, like, yeah, I can't, that's the best way I can describe it. It's just, like, a total, it's yeah. an overload, you know? Yeah, the it audio is. It is. is overloaded and your brain is overloaded. Yeah, but it but it's still very constricted, like you said. It's very much like it's a very constricted yeah. and like I don't know. I don't have 
number of words I guess I can try to find for it. But I don't know what the, what the word for it. But, it's, but yeah, it's not the sound of freedom. It's like the sound of... Coming up against something. Like, exactly. It's like, yeah. You know, you'll never push through that. Exactly. Wall. You just get lost in whatever you're pushing up against, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, what do you think could happen? You know, you you said you, you a lot of your analog gear and 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 methods come from stuff you find on the streets, and you know you have these machines that you've kind of been able to get for cheap and stuff like that. But I kind of talked to to, to, to Dilloway about this as as tape becomes first of all less and less like produced, like it's not really produced anymore. Except I feel like all the people who are producing right now are kind of like after effects like they're like oh let's bring tape back and like make a bunch of really crappy cheap tape so like hipsters can put out animal collective on tape and you know like stuff like that but like there's not really that active industry that's like working to like there's very few people producing new musical grade tape and i won't say but we were talking earlier and i used to work for a company that dealt with cassette tapes that's right I can remember a few years ago when there was talk of like, there's no more tape. Like that was like, that was what I heard when I went in one day and it was like, Oh, what what the fuck? And they were like, yeah, our supplier overseas is out. And it was maybe two or three months later. Oh, we found a new supplier in, I think it wound up being in Malaysia, maybe a factory that said like, we will, we'll start doing it again, you know, basically where at at the time it was like, well, national audio company, I think in the States is trying to produce their own in-house stuff. They probably, I don't know if they still are or whatever, but yeah, this was a couple of years ago now, but at, at the time the talk was like, yeah, the stuff they were trying out was not working out very well. Like it sounded like shit, you know? So Dude, this is crazy. Okay, you okay? You did mention this to me beforehand, and I didn't really m- understand the implications of this, but we won't talk about where you worked, but you have such a... I'm going to ask you a bunch of shit right now, because you have such an insider's perspective on something that's so opaque, and they keep it so opaque. Like the... I'm dealing with a tape supplier in Europe right now. Um. So with your, with your, I think, five, correct me if I'm wrong, five or so tapes that you have out that you've released under the name jute um is contempt the first one uh no contempt would be the second one i believe was the first one with data scrape on it the first one would be uh oh how am i blanking on soma it's called soma uh detachment did a reissue of it uh i think it came out last year uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. okay. I have them both in front of me here. Um but okay. So, okay, so Soma was Soma was the first one. I thought Contempt for some reason was the first one. In the- I did I did a self-released edition of Soma that was basically if I got an order, I would dub one and I dubbed some I so John Grimaldi who runs Detachment, he yeah. got in touch with me and uh I sent him these tapes and he wrote me and he was like, oh, these are bunk like dubs or whatever. (laughs) So I sent him the master file, but he, he was like, I, he mentioned, he said, I'd love to do a tape for you. Uh And if you want, we could do a proper reissue of the, of this Soma tape down the line. So contempt kind of is the first one because I feel like John doing it and having us like distribution on it. Yeah the thing that like people actually heard okay so soma came out more widely first and then contempt was reissued after that other way around okay other way around got it got it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. okay cool um what can you tell me about like the i guess the content of those i mean i'm interested in, uh, the question of content and form in harsh noise is yeah, I guess a big topic, um, but it seems like you do f- have some focus on content. I mean, what you've talked about, you have certain things that you're really, at least idea-wise, trying to attack 
with the project. How do those two tapes uh, differentiate from each other in terms of what you were trying to achieve there? Or just so, sound wise, I mean, not not the. I'm expecting you to say what the deep you know, actually. Uh, you know, what... Well, I think what like characterizes them both, maybe, uh, and like puts them together. Like they were made fairly c- close together. Mm-hmm. Um, Soma, the first one was sort of right before I started uh, my degree, and Contempt was when I was in my at the end of my first year, I think, or beginning of my second year. Mm-hmm. So I was actually like mixing them in a pretty nice studio at school. Cool. Uh, but I was also like early in figuring out how I was like making this stuff. Um, but I think uh, something that ties them together and yeah, is common between the two is like the use of like the vocal sample extractions. Um, And that is sort of like almost, that's sort of like where a lot of my interest in like making noise and like electronic music in general comes from is like getting into bands like Crass pretty early on where like if you listen to Christ the album or like Stations of the Crass, like almost every song is like buttressed by like tape collages Mm -hmm. that are extracted from like the television and like Mm -hmm. the radio and stuff like that. And those were always some of like my most favorite parts of those records. Mm -hmm. Um, And even when I was younger, I actually did like my dad, when I was very young, he gave me a, uh, like a boom box from the seventies or eighties that had like, you know, classic, like little stereo condenser microphones mm-hmm. under each speaker. Mm-hmm. So you could record with it as well as like play stuff on it. And I made tape collages like from movies and stuff, like mm-hmm. when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and those tapes, I know like the sources are both derived from. So I, I guess I kind of keep like an archive of stuff like from YouTube on my computer Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like I record the audio from like a lot of old news reports and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are things that come from like historical periods or situations that I guess I'm like interested in Mm -hmm. or, or tie into like my current interests. Um, And they're very like, I don't know. I always found like you're like blasting noise and then there's like a stop, a little chunk of like uh, some speech or something. And then bop, like that was the thing. I did that a bunch on those tapes from what I could remember. And like it very, like it all kind of hinged on those moments. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess it's just I sort of, yeah, like an outgrowth of like my practice of loving collecting that sort of like, I like to collect information, I guess. Like mm-hmm. I do the art on all of my releases so far and it tends to be like collage work. Yeah. Um, and, I, I, and I'm just not like a quite color, guy. Quite colorful also. I mean, like, it's it's it has a certain psychedelic a- a- aspect to it. I feel, or I don't know if that's a, maybe a kind of a reductive word to use, but it has a so, has a certain colorful yet bleak look. I also was curious: is the is the is the tape um, is that a is that a pulse even reference, or is that just just not? It's kind of a little, I, I like it is, it's but like, it isn't. It's like, like a nice, actually, it's like a different thing, but it's also like a nice metallic. Sticker. Yeah, I asked, uh, I asked John if we could do like some, some wavy, some wavy labels. I do like you saying psychedelic, you know, like that is something that I do kind of like shoot for, mm-hmm. with like my material as well, yeah. and like I like that aesthetic, and so yeah, I do. I mean, yeah, colorful but bleak. That's like kind of like. That's, that's life, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
so it's I like to I guess what I'm trying to spit out is that like in the visuals and in the in the audio as well like I just I'm collaging and I want to give like yeah a very vibrant uh, experience that is maybe a, a little psychedelic mm -hmm. for sure um, that comes but preoccupied with these dark what sort things. of what sort of historical or political um events or topics are you interested in when, how does that relate? I mean, you've, of course the, the technological issue is hugely political and that's, you know, you've already talked about that quite a bit, but um, what other sort of topics or angles are you interested in? I guess most broadly, it's just sort of the history of the 20th and the 21st century which is like tends to be characterized by like imperialist violence and you know i i don't want to say like too much stuff on here i guess that like not that i'm harboring insane thoughts or anything but like uh there's just such great evil that our civilization and society is built on the back of, and that's obviously like spun a certain way and propagandized in other ways um, that are just like, it's just like, I just think it's all like really fucking evil, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very like peace loving person, uh, you know, but so I guess the sort of like, I don't know, the violent nature of the sounds kind of go with that violence of like the history of, you know, especially in Canada, like a settler or colonial mm -hmm. state, um, that it's just like, yeah, like it's just kind of the classic punk stuff of just looking at the world and thinking like, it's so fucking wrong, you know? But I think, you know, Stefan said in, when you had him on there a few weeks ago, you know, like that sort of difference of like, oh, the punk people trying to like suggest a different way, maybe, um, and an industrial and noise kind of just saying like, look at this. And mm -hmm. there's like, I don't know, a middle path in there somewhere. I don't like to like, I think I put my message across without having to say. Sure totally out loud, like, fuck this, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, yeah, I guess that's what I'm just sort of broadly concerned with is just like, I just look at things and I just think it's, there's just so much that's so wrong. And, and the other thing, and maybe the more overbearing thing is just like, it just goes so fast because of this technology that we, there's almost no, I, there's just almost no hope for it. Like that's how I feel a lot of the time, you know, it just is, it's already played out farther in the future than we could even like conceive mm -hmm. in maybe a really bad way. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, know I don't know mean. if that's too broad, but no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Wars, like I know, you know, this imagery crops up a lot in the, my collages and stuff. And like, so I just kind of show, you know, like there is that, that violence are like, you know, our bodies are implicated, but also like we occupy a space of like being really removed from a lot of violence Yeah. in the world. Like everything's like so mediated, you know, there's just, there's a lot of stuff there, I guess. I try not to be like too glib with, with any of the imagery I, I, I use, I guess. Sure. Is that something that will continue to be a theme throughout your work? Do you mean, do you have any plans to, exp to, you know, elaborate on that or, or, or go deeper in that direction or anything specifically related to that topic that you want to achieve or, or explore further? I mean, I've got a few 
things that I've been thinking about releasing myself, and those might wind up, like, maybe what little money comes of it will, like, go somewhere else, you know? Mm -hmm. It won't go to the next release, mm -hmm. but um, not sure that's the best. At, I, I don't really know. But, I mean, I yeah, I'm always going to be preoccupied with this stuff, I think. Um, I don't know that it'll always be... I don't know, maybe my stuff is a little, like, on the nose a lot of the time. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. Try to, try to... I don't know. I try to walk a line with that. You know, I want people to put something of themselves into it when they listen to stuff, but um, there's stuff there to chew on too as well yeah um it definitely no it feels like that i mean i was curious if you had any any i don't know any plans to incorporate text or or, or imagery or something like that because i uh, uh it is suggested i mean i know i understand what you're su suggesting in there and it's felt but it's not i don't feel it's on the nose i mean it, i was curious if you had any plans to be more explicit or, some... or anything like that or i don't know working on there is a zine that i'm working on that will probably accompany like a future jute mm -hmm. release that is sort of experimenting like with my own writing and then writing generated by, uh, by an AI mm -hmm. network mm -hmm. and sort of like combining those. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working on that most of this summer, but kind of hung it up for a while to just come back to it and see if it's maybe worth it at mm -hmm. all. Um, but yeah, I, I am interested in doing stuff like that and it's probably coming down the line. Um, and video also, I've been working a little more with like trying to do video, uh, stuff, um, for my own recordings, but also, um, if we get back to a point when there's like lots of shows rolling through town again. It's insane to say that again, but it does st still feel very like quiet yeah. in terms of like gigs and stuff. Sure. Uh, I'd like to have, uh, I don't know. I bought a green. I'd like to do something, you know, like in the vein of like pain factory or whatever. Like, fuck yeah. TV, uh, that uh, yeah. I was doing like uh, filming performances and putting those up to be like accessible online, I think would be really cool. Definitely. I think that's great. I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that because I think, yeah, I do. I think kind of going back to the whole, you know, we're so deep in technology and all those things are so ubiquitous in our lives. Um, it would be nice. To, it would be nice to see more noise projects employ more of that multimedia stuff in a tasteful way. I mean, not like some corny, YouTuber type shit, but I mean, like, there's so much, there's so much there and it's getting easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper. And, you know, like that's, I think this, you know, like this podcast is like totally, there's such rich discussion that goes on, you know, uh, with everyone that you, you have on the show and to have it out there and like with this visual, it's like, it's so easy to do this, you know, like well, that's, would... that, that, that's my point is that like, I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, and you know, I, I did it because I felt like that was missing, but I also feel like this actually is super easy to do in terms of like technologically. Um, and how did, how have you come about some of your, your, your working relations with, with labels and things like that? I mean, det detachment programs has done two of your releases and you kind of explain how that came about. Um, uh, you know, absurd exposition is, Taylor, Taylor and I had known each other actually for like a, a, a really long time. Uh, I used to be friends. Uh, I used to be friends. That's awful. Uh, one of my friends uh, used to run a distro in Calgary, my hometown, uh, when I was in high school. And he's like the dude that I got all my punk and hardcore shit off of. And... Uh, we also like, he took me on some of my first trips to like see bands like outside, like in the States and shit. Like we went to the Pacific cool. Northwest in like 2007 and saw, uh, some great shows down there. 
but uh, mm-hmm. we were going one time. So I, Taylor and I used to know each other from like a Canadian equivalent of MySpace, basically. Okay. And I can remember going to Vancouver from Calgary for some shows in 2007 uh, or six, uh, where we actually like, cause Taylor also ran a distro at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we like stopped at his school and like him and my friend did like a trade, like <laughs> on his like lunch hour. I hope he's like high school? telling this fucking story, but like, yeah, we both would have been like 16 or 17 years old back then. Like high school? Yeah. Like high school. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But never knowing each other like very well for a really yeah. long time until I moved here, you know, and started yeah. getting into noise and stuff. Um, so, you know, I gave him copies of like that Soma tape that I did or something, showed him recordings and was like, mm-hmm. you know, doing noise now or whatever. And he eventually asked me if I do a tape. And cool. So I did that with him, but I don't. I try not to like solicit people to like release my stuff. It just seems weird to do a little bit. I I have considered it because there are labels where I'm like, fuck, like I could write an email and be like, love what you do. You know, this might be cool, blah, blah, blah. But I would rather if people hear it and they want to reach out, like that's much preferable to me. Like Stefan at new forces, like he just Mm -hmm. reached out to me and, asked if I would do something and, you know, like love the fucking labels. Like, yeah. So, you know, I get stuff on new forces through, through Taylor's distro, like whenever I can, like so many mm-hmm. releases. So like, yeah, for like, sure. Happy, like Manuel narcolepsia. I mean, I still, he's someone who's like reached out to me and I apologize, but like, I still owe him recordings, you know, but. Oh, cool. There's um, something planned for that. Yeah, yeah. So that's imminent. That's yeah. That's coming soon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But awesome. that's basically how it goes. Like I just I wait for someone to reach out. At, okay. So far, I mean, like we talked about a little bit at the beginning. Like I, am, I am like relative. Like I didn't even really start. Like even just listening to like noise until yeah, five or six years ago, probably. Sure. Yeah. Um. It maybe that's related to the reason, but it, you know you've been around for a few years, and relative to what a lot of noise projects do, you've put out relatively little stuff. Not not really, but I mean, like a lot of noise projects come on the scene, and I mean your first shit is really good. So it's not like you felt like I feel like oh I don't know, but I mean your first shit was really strong. It's like a lot of people come out strong, or then like oh wait I'm doing noise and I'm good, and like there's interest like. Then they put out like six, seven things in a year. And you've kind of spent like one to two, it seems like, a year kind of since then. Is that is that just because of label cooperation or is that or do you just work do you work like that or is that a conscious decision? No, yeah, it's just kind of fits and starts for me. Like I just kind of like I find it hard to work on stuff sometimes in a way that's like up to my own standards or or whatever. Or like maybe get a new, a new piece of gear, or whatever, and like maybe takes a while to like get acquainted with it and learn. Mm-hmm. Like, is this like actually like worth keeping? Is it for this yeah. sound? Do I use it for something else? Like, I don't know. Um, and I think some of that comes from like I kind of started the project when I started my degree, which is like concerned with all this kind of stuff surrounding sound. Um, So yeah, it's more just like, I haven't really, I only want to put out stuff that I'm like really happy with, especially if it's for somebody else. I'm way more ready to put out my own stuff like myself. I don't do a terribly good job with like getting it out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I do kind of like there is that like split. I'm like, okay, that's something I can like do on my own time. This is like some shit for someone who's like asked me, I got to make it fucking 
Yeah. But it's like, I, it's what I, I want to, I want to hear, you know? Yeah. I know I, a lot of people say that, but it's true. No, it's good. I mean, I, I think that's a really good thing. Good. I mean, it seems obvious, but it seems like a really good approach to have is just like, yeah, don't but rush I, things and don't put out too much stuff because I don't do, do you, do you, in your following as a fan or as a kind of a colleague of other noise artists and kind of a participant in the noise scene, do you, do you get the sense that people are a little too hasty or too, too prolific sometimes? Yeah. Well, for sure. I mean, I think there is like, but you know, I don't want to think about it like overly critical because like maybe there's people who have like, mad stuff like in the can you know and they're just kind of like yeah. boom 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 and it they, they plan it that way like that's fine that's like yeah that's good marketing or whatever you know like, <laughs> uh but i do you do see stuff where it's like sit on like i i don't know if you're mixing your own shit like you should be like in my opinion like you make a mix of some tracks for a tape, like don't listen to it for a week and then like put it on your fucking iPod for a week and like listen to it like every day for a week and then put it away. Like that's how I am. Like I, yeah. there's stuff that like was, you know, I intended to send out like really quickly and then I just kind of like listen to it and it, I don't know, it can be a trap, I guess, but I think, there's a lot to be gained from like spending a lot of time with your own stuff. And it can't be just in the initial session of recording it or the first time you mix it. Like you should never be like mixing something for the, I shouldn't say that, but like I would never like mix something for the first time and be like, fuck yeah, send it out. Let's go (sighs) stamp of approval. Like, no, like, don't listen to it for like a week and then check it back and you'll hear shit that you're like, Oh, okay. Let's, or maybe not. I don't know. Right. Maybe you listen to it a week later and you're like, fuck, that's even better than I remember it being. Yeah. That's also like a great thing that happens, you know? Like, yeah. So I just want to be sure. Put yeah. Product. <laughs> do, do you, um, do you, have different like monitoring setups that you check stuff on? Are you, are you pretty, I mean, I see you have some like kind of like decent near field monitors there in the background, but do you, do you go through and like, do you, do you check yourself on various systems and you think before you, I'm not before crazy you finalize it, it? But, like, yeah, I, I mix on like old rocket fives. They're five inch, uh, first gen rocket mm-hmm. near field monitors. Tons of bass, but I'm also just in a room that's not treated at all. Mm-hmm. So I don't think about it too. It's just like, there's some speakers, mm-hmm. they're fucking bass heavy. So I check them. I have another set uh, in my bedroom over here. That's like just some bookshelf speakers that I found on the street. They're probably like three inches. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I check stuff on those and then just like put it on my phone, headphones. Yeah. Uh, if I'm mixing like here on headphones, I live in a, an apartment. My neighbors have like a baby and shit. So I mm-hmm. can't, I used to, this is another thing. When I was making my first tapes, I was living in an apartment where like, I could be so fucking loud. Like mm-hmm. I would check my mixes in the living room. Like those old, like commercials where the guy sits down yeah. in the chair and it's like, <laughs> flat. like that's like yeah. what I do. You know? Cool. Uh, those days are over, but. Uh, I use like, you know, AKG 420 whatevers. Yeah. Uh, they're like nice and flat. And then, yeah, just like whatever fucking like shit Walkman. Yeah. And if it's good for, you know, those, it's probably good for anything, I guess, in my opinion. What, what, uh, do you mix in a DAW? Yes. Which one do you use? I do editing in a program called Amadeus Pro. Okay. It's a, it's kind of like a small time, like Mac equivalent to like audacity. 
Mm-hmm. It's something a prof at school put me onto, and he's he knows the guy who like wrote the program. So mm-hmm. in second year, I remember he was like, "Oh, if there's any anything that you, you know think you would make the program better, like let me know." So there was some shit about you know like exporting tracks, and we told him, and like the new patch of the program that came out, it had all those changes. It's a great amazing wow. program for editing audio like recording like if you're recording on a four track i like dump my stuff in on that you yeah. can you can get almost sam you know you can get sample accurate editing wow. you know, like zoom in chop your waveform at a zero crossing like no problem uh but in terms of mixing processing through like effects and stuff i use ableton ableton Live. okay yeah, and is it is is it, I feel like I've heard of Amadeus Pro, but I would, not much. Is it um, is it a multi track multi track editor? Uh, as many tracks as you want. Like okay, okay, okay. Create a track. You know, is, I, I, I've never really used Audacity. I some for some reason in my mind I have that it's just like stereo. But is that true? Is this, is is Audacity also multi track? No, you can do uh, well because we we had to do stuff in school that was in five channels like playback okay and that is the program we would like put our stems into because it does offer like really simple like revving okay. you know if you wanted to have five speakers yeah it's really easy to just send a channel here or there audacity uh amadeus oh no no but i'm, I'm just curious about audacity because i know that's what a lot of people use it is audacity is audacity uh, also multi-track I never used it much. I assume it's kind of the same thing. It's like a very bare bones. Okay. It's not yeah. for like, I mean, I guess people do use it to mix like whole compositions, but in my mind, it's more about like editing. Like okay. you want to cut something to length or like I use it to make like, uh, if I want to make like a really clean loop of mm-hmm. something to get the zero, I don't, zero yeah. crossing, like, uh, explain. I mean, I know what zero crossing is, but explain that what it is for for people maybe. So, yeah. So when you you're editing a waveform and you're gonna chop something, if you don't want the beginning of the fucking sound to go, I have some weird artifacting on it. You have to cut it at a zero crossing, which is where the waveform crosses zero dB. So if you're just looking for a point on mostly any audio editor where the waveform is going to come across this horizontal line mm-hmm. and cut it there and make sure that you're not cutting up here at plus six or down here at minus six. And that's going to give you a clean edit, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's probably as easy to do on audacity as anything. I just happen to have a Mac. So Amadeus is the stuff they gave us in school. And it's like, I fucking love it. You can run plugins in it and stuff, but it's not like um, in Ableton where you can sort of real time hear something being processed. You have to like, in Amadeus, you would have to say like, highlight the waveform and be like reverb. And then it would take like two seconds, process it and give you the new waveform. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's amazing. Just highly flexible. A lot of, you know, undo, redo, possibly like if you're making mistakes yeah. or want to do multi-channel stuff. It's it's an incredible program. Yeah, cool, cheap too. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah. Um. So, um, I would like to ask you the question I like to ask everyone, and that is, what are your top five noise releases of all time? Yeah, this is uh, this is hard. You knew it was I, coming. I, I almost made a list, and then I was like, "No, you can't make a list." Uh, Somebody will do it at this point. It's fine. So no, I'll say maybe I'll. You know, some of them might be a little like fudgy. I guess you're the final judge on it, but like definitely "Heathen Earth" by Throbbing Gristle mm-hmm. in terms of like su- gateway release mm-hmm. that's doesn't get better than that for me mm-hmm. um 
probably like MSBR Collapse Land. Is mm-hmm. that the name? Collapse Land? Yeah. Or Ultimate Ambience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really love like this is another thing where like I've only kind of been into stuff so long that I could say like early aughts not even that it's not even that old but like Tiger Smells a Corpse by Purian mm-hmm. uh, or like Annihilationist mm-hmm. um, really love those what is that like three that's three probably physical evidence by non mm-hmm. and yeah like pittsburgh by macro or mm-hmm. grind you know mm-hmm. uh amplified humans basically like prime era and macro is the stuff mm-hmm. that really like set me off to like try and make my own shit cool yeah and then what about five newer releases of the past year two three if not releases then like projects or you know all can also be that's, that's workable uh that's like almost easier yeah yeah um i really like the two uh golden purifier tapes that came out Mm -hmm. uh last year or this Mm -hmm. year whatever it is Mm -hmm. uh those were like really fucking good um probably a little bit it's maybe pushing the three years but yeah i can't remember if it's 2019 or 2020 but uh grant evans tape on monorail trespassing Mm -hmm. uh, albatross Mm -hmm. that is like i play that constantly it's so fucking good um scarver of the sewer election lp that came out uh last year the one on second sleep yes yeah that's like amazing, black and yeah. white cover. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Tide also. I really loved uh, like uh, Blizzard amplification. That mm-hmm. was also fucking insane. Um, the stuff that's been coming out on Vast Field Magnetism out of Toronto, uh, Barrett, Barrett's label. That stuff is all really, really good. Really like that. Um, it's what four shredded nerve. That's probably one of the I I try to get anything I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, shredded nerve uh, turning turning grave. I think was the last thing I heard, and it's fucking. Which awesome. one is that? I well, that, that's a, that's a self that's like a self released one, right? Or it's like a CDR, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I haven't heard that yet. Yeah. Or it's like a yeah tape with a red. Or is it tape? Cover. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. With a red thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope I have some. I think I have some on the way. Really Let's good, see. really good. Cool, good, nice. nice I list. should say, can I give one general runner up because it was also a thing that I heard like when I was first, like starting to make shit was the Am uh Crackdown box on Hospital. Cool. It's it's great. Canadian. Um, yeah, Canadian. It's also Canadian. <laughs> and it's Quebec, Quebecois on top. Yeah. Of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very cool. Nice. Um anything else you want to uh, let us know about what I mean what, what you've you've got something else coming up for narco you got something coming up for narcolepsy as soon you said. Yes. I want to yes, I want to send Manuel some masters soon. A, been talking about it for a while and it's just yeah i just it's i just haven't been making a lot of stuff lately but yeah that for sure um cd on absurd exposition oh 
uh, CD for uh, AAD probably as well. Mm -hmm. A little bit shorter. And are those recordings that are done? Or are those plans? They're in in the works. I'm working on them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's been, been slow. I was finishing school for a while, and now I'm like working again. So I'm just kind of no. Like, that's that's cool. I mean, if yeah, you're working, yeah. that's that's a, that's 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 great. So I've that's, that's what's in the pipe, and some self released stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Killer. Looking forward to that all. Um, well, that's excellent. Uh, it was a lot of fun to talk to you. Oh, thank you. I was <laughs> great. To, yeah, great to talk to you and meet you as well. I'm big fan of first time, first time talker, long time listener. Cool. Good to hear. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, it was great. Cool, man. Well, uh, unless there's anything else you want to add, anything else you want to shout out or let people know about? Then I would say thank you so much, and uh... Uh, I'll just say rest in peace, Dave Finkelman, Taylor Scott, Jordan Stein. Uh, that's it. Peace and love. Fuck the government. Cool. In the extended segments of this interview, Sam gives some inside scoop on the current global tape supply situation from his time while working at Canada's biggest tape supplier. He also talks about building his own contact mics and electronics, and we talk quite a bit more about the untapped potential of current visual media technologies in the noise underground. Sam also made a 10-minute Jute video EP of remixed archival material, exclusively for supporters of this podcast. There's a whole lot more on the Patreon, bonus WCN-TV episodes, a private Discord server where supporters, podcast guests, and label alumni hang out and connect, periodic merch giveaways, discounts of the mail order, much, much more. Head over to patreon.com slash white noise to see all that's available and support this podcast.